He is none other than the Fortescue Medals Chairman, Andrew Forrest. Thanks so much. Great to be here, Steve. It's been five years. Long five years. Yeah, since we last saw each since other. Since we last saw each other yeah. and could talk about China. Now, obviously, you have been very bullish on the China market and as selling iron ore into this market. And we saw, obviously, the miraculous transformation over the last three or four decades in China. Things are slowing down right now. There are geopolitical threats. How much of a threat and how much of a competitor is China versus the opportunities that you've always seen here? Look, if you, maybe you're referring to the iron ore price. I see it as a bit of sport, Steve. You know, <laughs> it goes up, it goes down. Um, it's like a, like a tennis game. Um, but I don't see China as a threat. I advise everyone to not see China as a threat. And I certainly say to everyone in China, don't ever be a threat. The beauty of Asia, the beauty of the bar forum, is that we can all compete. We're all technically very, very capable, very professional. We love that energy of competition. And when we obey human rights, when we look after the environment, that lifts the standard of all of us. And this is the Bao Forum for Asia. This is the Asian community working together, different politics, different religions, different ways of doing things, different culture. But we all get on. And when we com compete successfully, everyone wins. Okay, it's a bit of a sport. Let's get into iron ore. Uh, I know you don't like projecting prices, but it's been a volatile game, if you will. And we are hearing, though, the iron ore inventories are piling up at the ports. We know that steel rebar uh, prices are at a seven-month low. Look, they're not building as much. They are going into new productive forces, into AI and semiconductors and some value-add services, less roads, railways, bridges to nowhere and the like. What does that mean for you? <laughs> Steve, that's such a quick slip in, isn't it? Um, I'm, not, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here. <laughs> I love it. Look, I've been part of this uh, country about 35 years. I've just seen it change, evolve, change, evolve. Now, yeah, it had a big housing run then, then big infrastructure run, uh, and now it's got a big technology, green energy run. It's still doing housing. It's still doing infrastructure. Don't, don't think for a second. That 5% growth... That is like years back when I thought five percent pretty ho hum. Coming off a small economy, this is a monster economy now, Steve. Five percent of that volumetrically is massive. I challenge my country. Hey, we're hardworking, we're super smart, we're determined. Why can't we do five percent? That five percent will translate into huge demand for commodities now. I don't mind if the iron ore price goes up or down. It's set by a free market. Anyone tries to meddle with that free market, they pay for it badly in the long term. But while free markets exist, you will always get supply equaling demand by that great agreement price. So I'm very comfortable about it. Do you have more clarity than the layman like me in a property market mess? I mean, we have other bellwethers, Van Ke, uh, Country Garden, others who are defaulting and potentially going under. Yeah, I this do. Is a, this is a big problem. What's I, your I, do. I want to give you the inside scoop. <laughs> the inside scoop, right? So yeah. if you're building out infrastructure and housing the size of Australia every year, yeah. then you're going to overshoot and undershoot. I mean, it's just how it's going to happen. Even AI is not going to work that out for you. So I've seen China over three and a half decades go from undershooting and prices go through the roof, overshooting, prices go down. But generally, they get it right. And the long-term trend is just heading upwards now. Green energy, that is a monster consumer of everything. Yeah. Right? And so it should be, because we're not taking all this rubbish to destroy the world out of the ground, where it should never move from. We're making all the energy, all the metals, just from the air moving, from the sun shining. That's that's the future of humanity. Well, how is the transition? And that's taking a huge amount of metal. How is that transition going, though? Because most of your revenue still comes from iron ore. I mean, the vast majority of it. But green hydrogen and other projects that are dear to you, how, how is that transition going? And it has been delayed. It, does it potentially get delayed by, I know you're not going to say it's a slowing Chinese economy, but yeah. it's a slowing pace of growth in China. Uh, look, uh, if you're talking globally, there's a whole heap of fish swimming with the tide now, very trendy. They've just worked out there's a war in Ukraine. You're a genius. How'd you figure that? Oh, by the way, um, oil and gas is incredibly volatile and green energy is not being supported by politicians as they should be because they're not being held to account by their populations. And so everyone's saying, saying well, if you're going into green, you're a little woke, etc. And we should just stay practical. 
uh, and stay with oil and gas. I can tell you that will be no solution. This will be like COVID, where mm -hmm. there was pent up demand. We weren't able to see each other. You and I missed each other for five years, yeah. right? But the demand pent up, pent up, and then once we could, everyone travelled, demand went through the roof. This will be the same, Steve. There is this, there is this period of time where because of volatility in prices, because of uncertainty, thanks to Ukraine, Gaza, etc., everyone's jumping on the bandwagon of weak character, of not having the courage to see over the horizon, see, actually, we don't move away from fossil fuels, then we will be held completely accountable. When we're told, oh, well, hang on, it was, it was uncertain times back in 2024, so we didn't do anything. And people are going to say to us, what? You couldn't chew gum and walk? Yeah. You couldn't breathe while you walked upstairs? I mean, you should have moved away from fossil fuel and gone into energy, which is harmless, as quick as you possibly could, and that's what Fortescue's doing. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was obviously in Australia a week ago. You were just in Beijing at the China Development Forum. What's the key message you got from the Chinese leadership, which has been fairly opaque in its policy messaging? Uh, they're not having press conferences. They're reading from the same script from the top man, understandably yeah. so. But what did you glean? Well, not really understandably so. I mean, when we have media coming through our organisations, we've got 20-plus thousand people. We don't have a script. I mean, Bloomberg walks onto any site it likes and just speaks to any punter out there wearing the high vis and the proud Fortescue um, helmet, and they are pumped. And they say, well, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're going. When you all read off the script, then people are understandably thinking, well, hang on, where's the naturalness in this? Where's the spontaneity in this? So I would say, of course, just be natural. This is a fantastic country. Mm. You're doing well. Make sure you stay at peace with all your neighbours. That is key. And also know that the Bauer Forum for Asia is the boiling pot of great competition, great technology, great business. And when we stick to minimum human rights levels, which protects us all. When we do, as President Xi's asked of us all, which is to realise that humanity is nothing unless we have a great environment. If you don't protect yeah. the environment, then see you later, humanity. Yeah. He gets that. That's how he grew up. He saw the environment destroyed and he saw poverty come into his community. So we've got to learn from that lesson globally. And I'm seeing this competition and this collaboration and this friendship from the Bauer Forum and it's an example for all of the world. Different politically, different religions, yet we all get on. Yeah. It does take two to tango. That's my devil's advocate approach. Yeah. You have to look at both sides, obviously. Yeah. All sides. Okay. You're talking about the environment. You're also talking metals. Are you glad you got out of nickel? I mean, Wailu metals, you closed down some of those mines. There have been allegations of Chinese and Indonesians kind of flooding the market with lower grade nickel. Uh, there's been environmental damage around Chinese mines. Are you glad you got out? No, I mean, I'm still... Are you going back in? I'm still so long, Nicola, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm <laughs> so long. Um, I, and look, look, we'll continue to invest in nickel and renewables everywhere. At Fortescue, it's copper, it's lithium, it's the whole suite. Rare earths, obviously iron ore, integral to the energy transition. What I say about that particular instance is I've watched China start to really protect its human rights. And... You know, I'm talking the hot buttons like Xinjiang, et cetera, mm. where uh, more and more audits are being done by companies like mine who just cannot touch anything to do with modern slavery and never will consciously. I'm seeing the attitude come into the environment, led from the top, saying, hey, we have got to lead the world to go green. If we don't, this planet's and every human in it's cooked. So I'm seeing that. Now, that's working in China now. China has to take that additional step, right? You've, if you're getting your human rights right and your environment right at home, that's got to be the same as your supply chains. And when I look at Indonesia, what I'm seeing is very delicate and rare tropical ecological systems get destroyed at huge scale. I'm seeing coal mines get switched on, coal-fired power stations get switched on. I'm seeing tangs getting dumped in the sea and washing hundreds of kilometres up, destroying marine ecosystems, which I happen to be pretty close to. And I'm saying... Well, thank God we didn't do that. We were offered those opportunities. We didn't take them. This is where countries got to say, well, if I'm looking after my country at home, I've got to have exactly the same standards mm -hmm. when I'm overseas. And that's not happening in Indonesia. And I'm saying to the London Metal Exchange, hey, 
you're getting people who are doing the right thing competing against people who are destroying the environment. You, London Metal Exchange, have to determine the difference of that. Otherwise, you're part of the problem. You're part of the environmental crime. And I'm saying to those Chinese investors, clean up your act. Stop rubbishing the ocean. Stop destroying the rainforest. This is where we must all step up as humanity and do what President Xi's asked of us to those China investors. Protect the environment. You don't protect the environment, you destroy humanity. And I'm saying, quickly come back from where you are. You've had a really bad start. You've produced really cheap nickel. Congratulations. But you're destroying other people's future. And I say to Tesla, I say to the Chinese car companies, I say to all those battery makers, buy your nickel from there. You too are part of that environmental crime. And let's just say, OK, let's get these nickel mines right. Let's run them on green energy. Let's not destroy the marine environment. Let's work out how to mine and reforest, but not destroy. Reforest, Andrew Forrest, thanks so much. <laughs> Always thanks, good to Pete. see you.